don't drop the soap, they say, and everyone LOLs, ha, 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 ha. But in reality, sexual assault in prison is a huge issue. And its history actually sent me down a rabbit hole learning about the problem of conjugal visits. Prisons introduced these conjugal programs where inmates could see loved ones and like, you know, maybe have sex, wink, wink. The idea was quite successful for several decades. But even though the American prison system makes billions of dollars every year, these days, conjugal visits are extremely rare. So here's my question. I mean, if conjugal visits were so great, then why did they stop? Was it pissing someone off? Was it making someone jealous? Money? Sex? Drugs? Well, hang tight, kitty cats, because today we're diving into conjugal visits. Yeah, I know this might be random, but listen, the history behind it is shady and real dirty, and it's very concerning for human rights, and that's why we should care. Thank you so much. Hi friends, I hope you're having a wonderful day today. My name is Bailey Sarian and I'd like to welcome you to my podcast, Dark History. Look here, we believe that history does not have to be boring. I mean, yes, a lot of it is very tragic and some of it is kind of happy, but either way, it's our dark history. So all you have to do is sit back, relax, and let's talk about that hot, juicy history goss. Okay, listen, don't lie. When you hear the word conjugal, does your mind immediately go to conjugal visits? Of course, right? Or maybe you're like me and it just straight up reminds you of that scene from Goldsmember where Dr. Evil is in jail, you know? Daddy's all pent up, let's freak. I don't know, look, it's just become like, you know, it, over time it's kind of a, a punchline. But as we've seen on this series time and time again, you know, it's the things hidden in plain sight that always seem to have the darkest backstory. And oof. The history of conjugal visits is about way more than sex. So look, it all starts in a little Southern town called Parchman, Mississippi. Now, Parchman is pretty close to the Mississippi and Arkansas border. And in the 1900s, it was like a very rural farming area. You know that word, rural. I nailed it. But Parchman was known for their massive prison. It was called Parchman Farm, which kind of like sounds like a factory where they make cookies. Parchman Farm, right? But no, it was a huge prison built on top of a former plantation. In the early 1900s, the whole South was a mess. When slavery was abolished, all the plantations and businesses across the South were suddenly unable to operate because they relied so much on free labor. In other words, slave labor. You know, the only reason anyone made any profit was because they didn't have to pay their workers. And without that, their businesses completely fell apart. Between 1861 and the 1900s, Southern states were arresting tons of men, specifically young black men. Some of the arrests were legit, but most, honestly, most of them were not. I mean, a lot of them are being charged with like either fake or exaggerated crimes. And to many, it felt like it became another way to round up anyone from the black community and keep them in prison. But why would local governments like want to pack their prisons with people on bogus charges? Well, once these men were sentenced to prison, that's when the government would lease out prisoners for cheap manual labor. So local businesses would literally rent these prisoners for a day to like help with whatever they needed help with. The prison would make money, the businesses would make money. They were like, hey, just high-fiving, win-win for everyone, you know, except the prisoners, obviously. And a lot of the time, the kind of work the inmates were doing was inhumane. Prisoners were forced to like clear out swamps full of parasites with diseases like malaria, or they would have to risk their lives in order to create tunnels for railroad companies. You know, like in order to make a tunnel, you have to blast dynamite through rocks and dirt and stuff. And uh, the prison people were like, blow that up. Could you imagine someone gives you dynamite? Go blow that up. Good luck. So what I'm saying is it was dangerous, okay? The prisoners worked all day, all night doing jobs like this. And if they were caught 
like quote unquote slacking, or the guards believed that they weren't working hard enough, a lot of the times they would get punished. One of the prisons that was working their inmates to the bone was that prison, Parchment Farm. Um, it opened in 1901 and it was humongous. Look, it had over like 20,000 acres of land. And on the land itself, there were three separate farms that the inmates would work on. Prison officials were making some serious money off of this whole little scheme they were doing. And by 1918, prisons like Parchman Farm were earning $800 per inmate for their work. Yeah, in today's money, like the calculations, that means the prison would make like $17 million per year from all of this convict labor. I mean, that's a lot of money, right? Yeah. So, I mean, at this point, Parchman Farm made it look like slavery had never been abolished in the first place. Because Parchman Farm loved saving money, instead of hiring prison guards to manage the work, they decided it would be a good idea to put the most violent prisoners in charge of everyone else. They're like, yeah, that's gonna be great. These prisoners, they were called trustees and they were given guns and permission to keep the other prisoners in line. I'm giggling because it's like, that's gonna go well. I'm sure, right? I don't know. Look, I don't know who was paying off the press, but like they seem to be doing a great job because no one really knew what was going on at this place. In fact, there were even articles in the in the paper about like how great life was at Parchment Farm. Yeah, a literal quote from a New York Times article in 1911 said, quote, the pride of Mississippi, however, is the Parchman. Instances have been known of when black people were turned out of the penitentiary, given a new suit and $10 in money, they would not want to leave and would inquire if there was not some way by which they could stay there. Wow, everyone just wanted to stay, allegedly. They were begging. Well, that's what Parchman was saying. You know, okay, sure. In reality, the inmates were being worked to death for profit. So prisons like Parchman had created a problem for themselves. They had a profitable workforce, but working your prisoners to death wasn't good for business, right? So they got to thinking like, hey, you guys, how do we motivate the inmates? without having to pay them. And that's when whoever had this major light bulb moment, they realized the one thing missing from these men's lives, one thing that would for sure motivate them to work harder, something that makes the world go round. Hi friends, just popping in here really quick for a word from our sponsor, Apostrophe. Yay! Look, we've all been there. You've got an important event coming up and you wake up the day of with a fat, big old planet zit just right smack in the middle of your face. Recently, I had to go to a wedding and like the day before, I just like broke out all on my jawline and it was like, I mean, thankfully it's on my wedding day, but still, you know, I get it. Acne can like get in the way of just feeling confident in your own skin and apostrophe, well, they get that too. Apostrophe, if you don't know, is an online platform that connects you with an expert dermatology team to get you customized acne treatment for your unique skin. Through Apostrophe, you can get access to oral and topical medication that use clinically proven ingredients to help clear all types of acne, from hormonal acne to facial acne, and even like your back, chest, and butt acne. So no more standing in Sephora or wherever, just trying to guess like what's gonna be best for you. Simply fill out an online consultation about your skin goals and also your medical history. And Apostrophe will connect you with an expert dermatologist to do the hard part for you. I've been using Apostrophe for years and my biggest concern has always been to maintain my um, acne prone skin because when I get stressed or hormonal time of the month, I break out all right here. So I always wanna make sure to prevent that from happening and to make sure that I'm clearing out any of the dark spots from the acne left behind. It was super simple to sign up for my first visit and a dermatologist customized my initial treatment plan, especially for my unique skin. I mean, I didn't even have to leave my house. The appointment was online and my prescriptions were shipped directly to my door. Snaps. 
We have a special deal for our audience. You can get your first visit for only $5 at apostrophe.com slash dark history when you use our code dark history as a savings of $15. Now this code is only available to our listeners. And to get started, just go to apostrophe.com slash dark history and click get started. Then use our code dark history at sign up and you'll get your first visit for only $5. Big thank you to Apostrophe for partnering with me on today's episode. Now let's get back to today's story. So prison officials, they figured the prisoners, they might work even harder to like make the prison more profit if they had something to motivate them, you know? So they decide to bribe the prisoners with sex. Woo! So that's when prison officials brought in sex workers literally by the truckload, like they were in the beds of their trucks. And they would do this every Sunday. And the way that they'd earn a visit with these sex workers was to work really hard, you know, during the day. And then one of the prison guards would vouch for them and be like, yeah, he deserves it, let him get laid. But this sex bribe wasn't for all of the prisoners. I mean, research showed that they were specifically for black prisoners because the prison officials believed that the black inmates had a quote, greater sexual need than the white inmates. Yeah, I was like, okay. Uh. And what Parchman was doing with the sex workers definitely, it wasn't legal, you know? So they needed to cover their asses. So prison officials would say that the sex workers were actually the inmates' wives. Loophole. Now, they weren't like just getting sex workers behind like the bars and letting prisoners go at it. Prison officials had the inmates build these little houses out of scrap metal and then finish it off with like a, with like a coat of red paint. I know, why red? We don't know. But this became known as the red houses. So in the early days at Parchman, like these visits would be pretty like quick and dirty, you know? But as the concept of rewarding prisoners with sex became more popular, the inmates' actual wives were being like allowed in and more privacy was given to married couples during visitation time. So it was getting better. In the beginning, each conjugal room was separate from one another and private, which was a huge, change for, you know, the inmates. They were used to like being under constant surveillance and all had roommates. So this was refreshing, new. In prison, men are stripped, searched, and they have to ask permission for like any movement or activity or like just going to the bathroom. So having privacy was major. So it was nice because when the prisoners were visited by like their significant other, they were able to act like, you know, more like they did in the outside world. They felt normal again. And most importantly, like these men started to remember the life they had waiting for them at home. And you know, they wanna focus on getting released. Prison officials claimed that this system worked because their profits were, were up, which was all of the proof they needed. Plus prisoners were happy to work their ass off for like a piece of ass, right? It was a win-win, hello. This whole plan was so profitable, other prisons started to copy it. They brought this intimate visitation model to their own prisons. And by the 1930s, there were like no more secret truckloads of sex workers. All conjugal visits were now for spouses only, which hence the name conjugal visit. Now, when we hear the word conjugal, I think a lot of us just think of sex, but literally conjugal means related to marriage and married couples. That's the definition. So at this point of our conjugal visit journey, the only people benefiting from conjugal visits were men. Boo, I know. Female prisoners, they weren't allowed to like participate at all. Their thought was that women, they get pregnant and then they wouldn't be able to do like any of their prison work. And then the prisons won't be able to make money. Therefore, nothing for women. In other words, the prison didn't get anything out of making women happy. So jokes on us. So conjugal visits for women prisoners were completely banned. So boring. By 1945, Parchman, they started offering extended furloughs. Now this would allow temporary breaks from being in prison. And inmates were given permission to like go home and stay with their families. I've done a couple of murder mysteries in different countries where they where they do this still. And I was like shocked because I had never heard of this before because we don't do this anymore, right? 
I don't know, I'll circle back, but look, these furloughs were only available to prisoners who had proven to be like trustworthy and committed to bettering themselves, right? I mean, that makes sense. You don't wanna send out the psychos. So remember the inmates who were basically prison guards, the trustees? Well, they were even allowed a 10 day period of leave from prison for the Christmas holiday. I guess there was like less work needed on the farm at that time of year. So they were like, have fun, tell mom hi. On top of that, the trustees were such an important part of the prison's program. They needed to be kept happy. If all of this is sounding too good to be true, you're right. Prisons weren't just letting prisoners see their partners and families because like they wanted to do something nice for them. Another reason why conjugal visits started to expand is because at this time in the 1940s and the 50s, there was a big fear of what some people saw as a growing problem in America, homosexuality. These gays, they're trying to murder us. America was afraid of gay. And prison officials believe that like, if they did not supply conjugal visits, male prisoners would instead start having sex with each other. Oh shit, I know. I mean, before 1962, gay sex was a felony in every state. So people saw these men having sex with each other as one problem. Homosexuality is taking over. And like to them, the fear was once you go gay, I mean, it never goes away. So this is a huge part of why prisons were so invested in using the conjugal visit program, you know, cause they wanted to make sure that the inmates were in the In 1974, inmates were finally able to get visits from their whole family, usually on Sundays. And they were given like four hours to have a picnic with their wives and children. And some prisoners even constructed like swings and slides for the kids to play on during during their picnics. It's cute. The prisons like started allowing family visits that could last up to three days instead of for just a few hours. There were even apartments built on the prison grounds so family visits could take place in like, you know, a place of, of privacy. And around one third of the prison population in America could earn access to the program by once again, having good behavior. Something that I think speaks to the whole conjugal visit practice is how prisoners reportedly spent most of their visit time, like picnicking with their family and just having quality time with them. Like it's, it wasn't just about sex or a, the physical need. They just wanted to feel maybe normal for a second, to be with the people that they love and just have normal conversations, right? Like shit. And prisoners themselves claimed that the main positive effect of the conjugal and family visits was to prevent their marriages from breaking up. And then conjugal visits, they have a mic drop moment. Studies started to come out saying that conjugal visits reduced the amount of rape and other violent assaults in prison. So not only were they good for the prisoner's emotional well-being, but they were also proven to prevent prison violence. Who would have thought? Wow, being treated like a human actually has a positive effect? <laughs> what? The American Journal of Criminal Justice, well, they, they exposed a major smoking gun. They came out proving that conjugal visits do so much more than, than anyone thinks. From 2004 to 2006, a study showed that there were 400%, 400% more incidents of sexual violence in prisons that do not have conjugal visits versus ones that do. Bitch, what? Yeah. And I mean, I think to everybody, it kind of makes sense that if they would just allow conjugal visits, there would be less sexual violence in prisons, right? And with this knowledge that the researchers have gained, you would think that this would be kind of like a bigger deal because rape and violent assault is a very huge problem in prisons. In 2003, the Prison Rape Elimination Act, they claimed that the number of inmates who experienced prison rape in just the 20 years between 1983 and 2003 was over 1 million. That's a lot, right? Oh, this was an interesting fact though. In 2008, the US was the first country in history to count more rapes for men than for women. Bitch, that blew my mind. I was like, holy fuck, they're kind of right. 
So conjugal visits, they seem to have a positive effect within the prisons. But when people are doing so well, like this seems to upset others, you know? Happy inmates, how dare they? So people start looking for like any reason to be upset and get this whole thing to just come to an end. Have you ever wondered why laundry detergent comes in like those huge plastic jugs? jugs. They're just like so inconvenient and messy and there's gooey detergent everywhere. And the it's just, it's not convenient. It's like you're getting a workout just walking the jug to the self checkout line. Worst of all, 91% of plastic doesn't even get recycled. So that big old jug ends up sitting in a landfill for like literally hundreds of years. Fortunately, I found a new solution, Earth Breeze. Breeze, get it? Earth Breeze detergent doesn't come in a plastic jug. Imagine something that looks like a dryer sheet, but it's actually a liquidless laundry detergent that dissolves in all wash cycles, hot or cold. And it's super simple to use. Each sheet is pre-measured, so there's no measuring and no mess. You just take a sheet and you put it in and blah, blah. It's like once I used it, I was sold and I signed up for their subscription service immediately. I have full control to adjust, pause, or cancel the subscription with no hidden fees or penalties. And all of it, it's like shipped to my door for free. Hello, great. Most importantly, I still get the same powerful clean I've come to expect with like liquid detergent. Earth Breeze is tough on stains, fights odors, and my clothes come out clean every single time. Earth Breeze even donates 10 loads of laundry to a charity category of your choice with every purchase. So you can feel extra good knowing like it's going to a good place. I chose to have Earth Breeze donate to animal shelters because I love animals. I love animals. Oh, I love animals. Over 100 million loads of laundry have been donated by Earth Breeze. Now, every time I do laundry, I feel a little bit better knowing that Earth Breeze is doing good in my community and better for the planet. Woohoo! And like, you don't even have to make sacrifices. Laundry is easier, less messy, and my clothes come out smelling good. They feel great and no stains. Win win, people. Trust me, there is no reason not to switch. Right now, my listeners can subscribe to Earth Breeze and save. 40%. Just go to earthbreeze.com slash dark history to get started. That's earthbreeze.com slash dark history for 40% off. Earthbreeze.com slash dark history. Then out of nowhere, conjugal visits faced major cutbacks. And the cutbacks were all because of one guy, a guy named Robert Martinson. So Robert was like an American uh, sociologist who had his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley. And while he was there, he studied prison rehabilitation. He did this study and he published it and it was called What Works? He wrote this because Robert himself, he was arrested in the 1960s for being a civil right activist. And guess where he served? at Parchman. During his stay at Parchman, Robert got a firsthand look like into the American prison system. Robert was trying to answer the question, what works when it comes to prison rehabilitation? And I guess in his study, when he answered the question, what works? It was nothing, nothing works. I guess people interpreted his book to mean that like no correctional treatments positive or negative had any impact on the prisoners changing their ways and staying out of prison. So why bother? What's the point? And even if you gave them like visitor privileges or maybe you, you know, motivated them with snacks for good behavior, overall, it didn't matter because they would still go out, do more crimes and come back to prison if that was in their heart, you know? That was everyone's takeaway. And prison officials loved this because like all of those, all of those perks, they had cost money. So this guy says like none of it works. Let's cut costs and uh, get rid of them. Mm -hmm. So this little study, it ended up doing a lot of damage, um, especially because crime was on the rise at the time. And politicians were using this report to like justify cutting budgets for prisons all across the board. And on top of that, for some sick reason, this gave prison officials permission to treat the prisoners without like humanity, all because of a study. 
And after all, like, according to Robert, I mean, it didn't matter anyways, right? So this is really the villain origin story for why America's like prison system is more brutal than most other developed countries. So back in the good old days, conjugal visits were allowed in 17 different states. I mean, even like some of them evolved over time and started allowing gay couples to participate in the program, specifically in California. But today only four, yes, four states have any sort of conjugal visit program. So California, Connecticut, Washington, and New York. And most of the programs that do exist in the United States are reserved for prisoners who have like shown, again, good behavior or live under minimum to medium security. You can even be denied conjugal visits if you are convicted of violent crimes, you know, crimes against like a minor or a member of your family. And in most cases, if you are serving a life sentence, you are automatically denied. Which personally, I feel like they're probably the ones who need it most, right? They're in there for life. At least give them a pocket. There's funding for that. And in Connecticut, here's, here's a strange thing. In order to participate in their extended family visit program, which is their name for conjugal visit, there needs to be a child present, which when you think about it, it's kind of hard to like conjugate when your kid is there just watching. Or maybe you don't care and you just, eh. So without conjugal visits, couples are expected to keep their relationships alive in just like public visiting rooms. And the only physical contact they are allowed is like a two second hug. Yeah. So many people like choose to write letters and make phone calls on top of that, but lots of people just can't make it work under these circumstances and end up breaking up. Now this mainly only applies to state prisons. And that's mainly what I've been talking about up until this point. So. What about federal prisons? Well, it's actually a short story because conjugal visits are not permitted in any federal prison. And as of October of 2023, there are 158,000 inmates in federal lockup and none of them can relieve themselves and get conjiggy with it. I mean, in some cases, like federal guards will allow a handshake, a hug or a kiss, you know, at the beginning of a visit or maybe the end. And it's like, wow, thanks. But even if like all you can get is a two second hug, at least there's still regular visitation rights, right? Not so much because some prisons have started ending in-person visitation altogether, like Louisiana. Yeah. In 2017, Tiffany Burns, a Louisiana resident, she had a boyfriend named Krishan Brown and Krishan was serving time in prison about like an hour away from her. So Tiffany would, you know, make her phone calls to Krishan from the prison. And then on top of that, about once a month, she would visit him in person. So one day on her way out, she was given a pamphlet like by a guard. She's like, what is this, you know? And it explained that in-person visits were ending and would be replaced by video calls. And these video calls, they were going to cost $12.99 per 20 minutes of call time. This was 2017, so it was like, actually it was, you know, COVID wasn't even a thing. So they were ahead of their game, I guess. <laughs> While visitation access was already like a problem in 2017, it had only gotten worse in the years after COVID. As the virus was spreading back in 2020, visitation just ended because obviously of like the risk and the social distancing measures, X, Y, and Z, bleep, blah, bloop. There are prisons that have brought back visitation rights. Um, but it's changed like a lot. It's become very restricted in terms of like who can be seen when and where. And in, just like with conjugal visits, like prisons have said that the reason for ending in-person visitations is because of safety concerns, which I know it just sounds fake, you know, I'm like, okay. So, um, you know, why would prisons want to get rid of visitations, especially if they've been proven to do so much good? Don't you wanna have like, um, I don't know. Don't they want that? No? All right. Today, like many prisons in the US, especially private prisons, are only money focused. That's all they care about, okay? And apparently the prison phone system alone makes $1.2 billion a year. So they're gonna push to have you use that phone because in-person visits, honey, they're free. We don't like that. I did the math and we don't like free. Some prisons in the United States are still run as a for-profit business, meaning they are in the business of making money off of the prisoners. 
I mean, they don't care about the well-being of the inmates. Come on, they don't care about making them better people who never end up coming back to prison. They don't give a shit. Because in the end, to them, more prisoners means more profits. They're not gonna treat them like human beings. They're not gonna try and help them stay calm and not be sexually assaulted in prison. They're not gonna help them at all, it's just sad. It's a human rights thing, it's a violation. Come on, they're people. Prisons can like charge crazy fees, right? Like for phone calls, for video calls. And this might be the only way to contact a loved one for them, right? And again, like conjugal visits, they don't turn a profit, so they've been removed. Video call systems like the one Tiffany was told to switch to are now the only option for visitation in many of the US prisons. And just like any video meaning technology, obviously it's not perfect, right? Glitches, delays, and more importantly, it's just not the same as seeing your loved one in person. So most U.S. prisons still have not brought back conjugal visits, even after like the COVID restrictions were lifted. There are claims of like safety concerns, especially for visitors coming to see violent offenders, even though instances of violence between visitors and inmates are extremely rare. Even though conjugal visits started in the United States, it's been implemented all over the world. I'm talking Australia, Brazil, Canada, Israel, Spain, Denmark, uh, Sweden, Russia, Germany, Saudi Arabia, Mexico, the list goes on. You can f worldwide, but not here. It's so weird, you know? So all of them allow some version of conjugal visits. And there are like some prisons in Mexico who even allow their wives to live with them. Yeah, so the wives can like move in, live with some inmates in the prison facility. I know, I was like, I don't know if that's goals, wifey goals or not, but like I'm in prison too. I don't know, but good for her, you know, good for Mexico. So the United Nations has called for prisons everywhere to give visitation rights to all prisoners. They believe that it should just be the norm. And thankfully, there are some nations who are listening. For example, in Brazil, prisons allow conjugal visits weekly. And they even allow conjugal visits between inmates at nearby prisons. So if there's like a female prison in the neighborhood, they can give the, I know, it's fun. They can kind of give the inmates like a chance to date, essentially. And this got me thinking, you know, like that would be a great dating show. This inmate and that inmate, we get to know them, get their backstory, we fall in love with them. They meet up and we're like, oh my God, yay. Like, I hope she ends up with him. I'm in. So in Kenya, prison officials, they started conjugal visits as a way of stopping HIV from spreading in the prisons. And when do you know it? Once they started giving their inmates conjugal visits, the HIV infection rates had completely dropped and the prisoners had way more success with rehabilitation. Okay, look, if you're gonna get arrested anywhere, do it in Sweden because they have like luxury jails and stuff, prisons and all that. I swear, because like in Sweden, the inmates are in like more of what we would recognize as a, like a group home facility, you know? And here they have everything. They get to learn to cook. There's playgrounds for inmates' children to play on when they come and visit. And they actually just focus on treating their prisoners like real people with like real psychological needs. I mean, just what an idea they have over there. Now for all of those places I just mentioned, they see conjugal visits as a fundamental right that cannot and should not be taken away from prisoners. Preach. European prisons, they actually believe in maximum contact, meaning maximum contact when it comes to visitation because it's like shown to help rehabilitate prisoners. You know, it gives them a reason to change their behavior and get out for good, which is what they want. Now, what's funny, not like funny, like ha ha, but like funny in a dark way, is remember that guy, Robert Martinson, the guy who wrote that uh, study on prison reform, like not working? Well, you see, it was actually just a big old misunderstanding. Oops. Robert, he actually meant something completely different when he said, nothing works. Robert was arguing for like getting rid of the prison system altogether and arguing that the time for reform was over because prisons as a whole 
were no longer working and should be torn down. That's what he meant. And it seemed to be overlooked. Nobody read that part, I guess. So Robert's sweet little anti-prison manifesto was just misinterpreted. His tagline, nothing works, became like so popular that people ignored what he was actually trying to say. So instead of like influencing the people to end the prison systems, it actually convinced many politicians to go the total opposite direction and push for the death penalty. Yeah, a big oops. It seems like their thinking was that if prisoners can't be reformed, nothing works, then let's just remove them from society by put them down. So many successful programs, like not just conjugal visits, were discontinued, defunded, everything. And because of this, private prisons, like the ones in the US, were given free reign to like treat their prisoners however they wanted. And the little rehabilitation they were doing was considered just kind of useless. So instead of things like, you know, other prisons would have like therapy, counseling, job training, uh, you know, educational classes. Prisoners were just put to work, which is sad because like the average reading level for prisoners is about second grade. And prison education has actually been proven to have a huge impact on whether or not former inmates are able to secure jobs after they're done serving, serving their time, you know? Without rehabilitation efforts like reading classes or job training, prisoners are more likely to become lifelong inmates. Sadly, in 1980, Robert jumped out the window of his ninth floor Manhattan apartment to his death. Robert wanted to end prison because of all of the flaws and he had good intentions. And instead his study led to them becoming way worse. So the good news is that four states still allow conjugal visits. And for the people who are able to participate in the program, it's nice that they've had like a really positive impact. Back in 2014, Maisha Paul was able to see her husband, Marcelo Paul, for a conjugal visit once a month. At this time, he was at San Quentin State Prison in California. And Marcelo, he qualified for the program because he wasn't like serving time for a sexual violent crime or anything, but his sentence was 10 years long. So he got to, you know, do things. So Maisha, she ended up giving uh, an interview about the whole process. She was about five years into her husband's sentence and she just kind of felt like she was a pro at this visitation process. And in the interview, she talks about how she would always come like dressed in men's sweats um, because like the prison guards would make her change out of anything tight fitting or just straight up like say go home because she didn't have anything else to wear. And then after that, Maisha would go through the metal detector and they would just search her bag. And then she is like allowed into a room where she could pick out puzzles and games and even like some movies for her to, for her and like Marcelo to enjoy. In my mind, when I think of a visual of like a conjugal visit, I kind of think about like one hour and you, there's just like a room with a mattress which is nothing like that. <laughs> That's just me being nasty. It's actually a lot sweeter. At San Quentin, Maisha and Marcelo, they get to spend 48 hours in a two bedroom apartment on the prison grounds. And like, she brings food for them to cook and they can like spend their time watching movies, playing games, hanging out, and just like getting some alone time. In this apartment, there's even like a baby crib uh, because some couples will bring, you know, the kids for the whole weekend. Maisha says that for her conjugal visits, they're not really about sex. It's about quote, the smaller, quieter things like waking up together, end quote. I was like, oh, that's so sweet, you know? Yeah, it is about that. It seems like conjugal visits have always had some strings attached. It's never something nice that they do for inmates because God forbid, you know, treat them like human beings, you know? I think the saddest part, not even the craziest, like the saddest part is literally that hundreds of thousands of inmates, they don't have access to conjugal visits, even though they are proven, okay? Many studies have been done proven to be beneficial to not just them, but all of society. According to a study from the American Journal of Criminal Justice, conjugal visits are said to strengthen marriages that are probably hanging on by a thread, increase inmates' chances for having a successful life after prison, and fight back against the terrible effects of something called prisonization, which are behaviors, habits, little things people pick up 
um, or learn in prison in order to survive. And then they carry that out there in the real world. And it's like, what are you doing? You know, you think it would be that the whole point of prison would be to rehabilitate people, you know, so they could re-enter society. You would hope that's what a prison is for, uh, but it's really not. So yeah, conjugal visits are just way more complicated than I expected. And personally for me, what I know this episode seems random, conjugal visits, right? I watched this documentary on YouTube called Turned Out and it talked about what a big problem prison rape is. And I had, I had no, I, I had no idea. I never heard of this, right? And that's really what kind of led me into the direction of this episode because nobody talks about how big of a problem uh, sexual abuse that is going on in prisons, in male men prisons, and how nobody's looking at it. And it's a major problem and everyone should be looking at it, at least I think, right? And on top of that, like if conjugal visits can stop that, why are we not, why is that not for everybody? Period, thank you, right? Hello, let the people have sex. Well, you guys, thanks for listening. Um, I hope you learned something, I don't know. Let me know your thoughts, opinions, anything down below in the comment section or, you know, anywhere. And tune in next week because we'll be covering a topic that I personally think also doesn't get brought up enough. You know, there are stories that take us to the front lines of war in Paris, Italy, and even India. The characters in this story not only protected thousands of soldiers from death, but also brought comfort to people dealing with, you know, the PTSD of battle. Next week, we'll be talking about war animals. Yeah, oh my God, let me tell you, get that freaking tissue box ready because it's so touchy, you're gonna need it. Hi, you can also join me over on my YouTube where you can watch these episodes on Thursday after the podcast airs. And while you're there, you can also catch murder, mystery, and makeup. I'd love to hear your guys' reactions to today's story. So make sure to use the hashtag dark history over on social media so I can follow along. I love reading your comments. So now let's read a couple of comments that you guys left me. Tire biter? Okay. Tiger Biter, I'm already concerned. 1680 commented, if Dark History were made into a movie, Steve Buscemi should be the star. His family has a dark history, so he could write the script himself. Um, I hope Steve's playing me. I don't know, I don't know who that guy is, but why are you biting tires? Cause I don't know, like, why are you doing that? And I hope you're okay. Get your teeth checked on. Don't inhale too much because uh, uh, what's that called? That rubber, it's very toxic. It can kill you. Just the more you know. Jesse, 27, James, 89. Jesse James um, had a special request for me. I love Bailey's voice. Can you do a song cover sometime? <clears throat> Thank you. Actually, I've been working on my Shakira. Here I go. Oh, baby, when you talk like that, You'll make a woman go mad. You're welcome. Let me know. Did I nail it? No? Okay, great. Jensen Victoria left us an episode suggestion saying, Bailey, exclamation, why are you yelling? I dare you to do a dark history on circumcision. I can see that I would have my work cut out for me. You get it? <laughs> No, I like that idea, actually. I think that's super interesting. Good for you. Great job. Okay, bye. Dark History is an audio boom original. This podcast is executive produced by Bailey Sarian, Junia McNeely from Free Arts, Kevin Grush, and Matt Enlow from Maiden Network. Writers, Joey Scavuzzo, Katie Burris, Allison Pilobos, and me, Bailey Sarian. Production lead, Brian Jaggers. Research provided by Xander Elmore, Rodney Smith, and Colleen Smith. A special thank you to our experts, Roe and Adam Clausen. A special thank you to Jessica Charles. And I'm your host, Bailey Sarian. I hope you have a good day and you make good choices, right? I'll be talking to you next week. Goodbye.